Tonight we welcome Dr. Colin Steele. Colin has a Bachelor of Science, Mathematics, Astronomy, Astrophysics, and a Doctorate of Philosophy, Equilibrium, Eruption of Solar Coronal, Coronal, coronal <laughs> mag <laughs> Magnetic <laughs> Structures, both from the University of St. Andrews. Currently a member of the School of Mathematics uh, at the University of Manchester and a resident uh, of Dor at Sheffield. He, is a, he has a keen interest in many aspects of astronomy, including both theoretical and observational astronomy, and is familiar with many astronomical societies since joining Dundee Society in 1978. He has been a member He's been a member of the British Astronomical Association since 1984, a former president of the Scottish Astronomers Group, and has a doctorate in some aspects of the sun's atmosphere. With excellent ratings on ratemyprofessor.com, <laughs> with, comments, with comments such as, Colin Steele is an absolute legend. I wish he taught all of my courses. And the loudest and funniest man at the uni, absolute legend. It's easy to see why he was awarded a Teaching Excellence Award in 2021. With all this said, I'd like us to give Colin a warm expert in Swinton Astronomical uh, welcome and will even forego questioning his previous mustache. <laughs> well, thanks so much. It's excellent to be here. Last time I gave you a talk, that would have been over Zoom for reasons which are probably getting rather boring to keep referring back to. Uh, but I did go to the, the club in Swinton. I think it was around just before 2000. I did make a visit there. So that it's, uh, it's good to uh, be out at the observatory here. Now you will see here a chapter heading from an astronomy textbook. We see the details here, but let's look at it. The sun, an ordinary star. Isn't ordinary a wonderful word? It's supposed to mean you're unremarkable, but it ends up being, ends up saying something like inadequate in some way. Well, let's see. Let's see what a few other people think about uh, where the sun lies with respect to other stars. So we can move on one. Yes, here we have a few opinions here. The sun is the nearest star to the Earth and a very, here we are again, ordinary star at that. So that was Ian Nicholson. Okay, slightly better from Raymond Littleton. Though only of medium size and brightness when compared with other stars, why do we get the feeling that the next word is going to be but? And Patrick Moore said, it would be misleading to suggest that the sun was particularly feeble. It is, in fact, just about average. Average is also one of those words that we can play about with, but rather than do that, we, we note that we have some opinions about the sun if we look up at the sun, it dominates things. We try not to look at it so much it dominates things. But if we move on one, we can see here that we have something totally different here. And this was my intended route here tonight. Now, I'm aware we're probably somewhere along here. I'm also aware that I went this side of Sheffield, but uh, that's, a, that's a different matter. But this is put here to remind us that when we're considering journeys or anything, we might be working on different scales. That, yes, you are around here operating on one kind of navigation, and then for the last little while, from, um, I think it was from Neverhood and onwards, I kind of changed into a mode of, uh, yes, few hundred yards and then two rights and then two left and that uh, that got me here. So we do different things on different scales and indeed we will see scales. So moving on one, some of the earliest measurements of scales and things date back to the Greek times, Eratosthenes was actually the first person to do a reasonable measure of the size of the earth. He noted 
that on a particular day where he was, the sun got to seven and a half degrees away from the zenith. But he knew that 500 stadia to the south, the sun was directly overhead. So hopefully this is going to be the most complicated equation that I'll be putting in here. He was able to work out the size of the app. And he got, got it to about, um, you know, about 10% or so. There were all sorts of variations there. Of course, Christopher Columbus had forgotten that when his time came, or maybe he chose to forget it. It's one of those things that we'll never quite know. So that was one of the first astronomical measurements. Another one, if we can go to the next slide, came not too long after that, when Hipparchus noted a lunar eclipse and was able to note the size and shape of the Earth's shadow. And what he was able to do was compare the size of the Earth and the Moon and effectively work out how far away the Moon was. The next obvious one was how far away is the Sun? But the Greeks were not able to get good results there. There was one measurement that suggested in modern units about 5 million miles, but you know, that's not in the correct ballpark there. And it actually took some time, if we can move on to the next one, please, before people were able to measure the distances to the planets. However, they could measure the distance not in miles or other units that they had, but in terms of astronomical units. If we think about an inner planet here, we observe from the Earth, and the maximum angle that the inner planet is away from the Sun allows us to do, again, a few more calculations and work out the distance out to the planet, but only in terms of the distance between the Sun and the Earth. And something similar on the next picture, we have for an outer planet, if you think in terms of Mars here, if you have Mars at opposition, and then as the planets go around, wait until Mars is at quadrature, again, you have enough information, basically, the length of time it takes the Earth to carry out this journey, you're then able to work out the number of astronomical units out to the planets such as Mars. So people knew the relative sizes of the orbits of the various planets in the solar system, but they didn't know it in terms of any actual units until relatively recently, which we can hopefully see on the next one, that it was when there was, maybe just over 200 years ago, a team from A, which turns out to be France, went to B in South America, and they observed the planet Mars. And the effect is exaggerated here, but they could see that it was against different stars here, so they were able again to do various calculations and find out the relative, find out they knew the relative sizes, the sizes in astronomical units. Finally, they could work it out in terms of miles or kilometers, but obviously well up into the millions. So that actually gave us the size of the solar system. Now, if we can move on another one, here we see the inner solar system. Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth. And we have, yes, one astronomical unit in terms of miles and kilometers, or 8.4 light minutes. Light time is a very good distance. It's something that you can actually visualize relatively easily. It's much better, I think, than talking in terms of billions, trillions, quadrillions, and whatever. For one thing, 
those units are not absolute. It depends which continent you come from and various other things like that. But working in terms of light time, that's, that's a good unit here. But what we're going to do now is a few times move out by a factor of 10. So if we can go to the next one, we see in the center here what we had previously. And now we have one light hour takes us a little bit past the orbit of Jupiter and moving out another factor of 10, you can see 10 light hours takes us past the orbits of Neptune and Pluto. Well, let's go another stage here. The furthest known minor planet, Sedna, does go well, well, it comes within almost a light day at its closest point. But then if we move out again by another factor of 10, you can see here that we pass a light week, a light month, nothing in the picture, the planets have been left behind. We might have various bits of Oort cloud and everything, but moving out once more, Nothing's happened. We've still not encountered anything. We've gone out to one light year. 63,000 astronomical units and various things in terms of miles and kilometers. But we've still not come to any more stars. Let's have one final go by going out again here and we can see finally we go past the unit, which I've said is about 4.3, about 3.26 light years, still not got anything, but we do come across the nearest star at 271,000 astronomical units, 4.3 light years, and this other unit, 1.31 parsecs. Professionals tend to use parsecs and megaparsecs and so on as one of their main units. So finally, after all those jumps by a factor of 10, we come across the next nearest star. <clears throat> okay, so let's just, if we move to the next one, let's, and then the one after this, let's imagine we had the sun in the meeting room, the earth and the road that goes outside. Let's ask a question. Would the nearest star be somewhere in Swinton? I can no. see a no. I can see quite a few no's. Let's move on one. Oh, we've got a yes here. What do we mean by this? Maybe there's a clue on the next one. Just outside Ebenezer Middle School. <laughs> Well, it is a case of, um, I would be a victim of a very unfortunate coincidence that there was an Ebenezer Middle School in Swinton, but we can actually see that Ebenezer Middle School is in Swinton in South Carolina in <laughs> USA. So that gives us an idea about how isolated the solar system is and how far out you need to go to get to the nearest stars. But then if we move on one, we can see, yes, here it is, Ebenezer Middle School. I, I take it nobody happens to have walked past this today. What else do we have in Swinton, South Carolina on the next one? Well, it seems to be quite a flat place there. That's, uh, that's what occurred to me here. But, you know, a bit of water, various roads. Yes, you've got the obligatory white church being the eastern part of USA. So yeah, that's Swinton, South Carolina. There was another one, I think, over near Nebraska that I could have used as well. Okay, let's return, not to the frivolity, but of course it has shown us just what kind of scales we're working on. But if we can go on one more, the, ne the nearest star, other than the sun, 
is called Proxima Centauri. Now, if you're expecting that when the talk finishes, we can go outside and have a look for Proxima Centauri, there are several reasons that it's not going to happen. I can't use the one about it not being dark, although if I give talks in the summer, that one comes in as well. I can use another one that I could normally use and say it's cloudy. I'm able to use that one a lot for some reason. But there are two other reasons that would occur that occurred for all the talks that I've given on this subject, why we cannot see Proxima Centauri. And it's too far south. It's visible from the southern hemisphere or areas near the equator. But at 53 degrees north, we cannot see it. But the other reason is this one. Visual magnitude 11.1. Now, that's not naked eye visibility. It's not even close. You can't see it with binoculars. A standard DSLR would probably not be able to show it. And we're thinking, if the nearest star is so faint that we can't see it, what does that suggest about stars further away? And it almost looks as if I'm trying to convince you that when you go outside at night, you don't see any stars at all. Well, it's true, but not for the reason that uh, I seem to be going here. The only way out of this, if this nearest star is so faint, the only way out of this seems to be some stars really are brighter than others. Let's bear that one in mind. This star here, Proxima Centauri, Proxima means near, Centauri, it's in the constellation of Centaurus, parts of which are, or at least were, visible from Greece. Absolute magnitude, 15.5. This is a figure about if you were to put all the stars at a standard distance, how bright that they would appear. It's an M5 dwarf star, I'll maybe come to that. 300 day rotation, flare star associated with the Alpha Centauri system. But the main point we get from this, the nearest star is really very faint. Well, we'll be able to put it into context here. But if we move on one, we see now when I said it was an M5 star, M is the scale effectively of the temperature, the color. Cool stars over here, hot stars up here. M means it's red, but it's very faint. So that's where Proxima Centauri would be on the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. Then, if we move on another one, the next nearest star we come to is called Alpha Centauri. It's actually a double star. You can see, well, we can see stars like this, but not from here. If you go further south, you will see them. One would be a star a bit like the sun, one just a little bit fainter and cooler. But together, this is a double star system, and they reckon Proxima Centauri is also associated with this system. And you said the nearest star to the sun is the various components of the Alpha Centauri system. What's the nearest star to the Alpha Centauri system? Maybe it will, or maybe it won't be a surprise. It's back at the sun. It doesn't have to be that way, because if we look at the next one, well, I talked about Swinson a minute ago. Let's say something about Mexborough. And if we look at a map here, what's the nearest place to Mexborough? According to this map, Old Denebe. But what's the nearest place to Old Denebe? 
Well, let's see what we have on the next one. No, oh, that's then to be mean here. So just because the nearest star to the sun is the Alpha Centauri system, it doesn't have to mean that the nearest star to the Alpha Centauri system is the sun, but it happens to be the case. So if we move on another one here. Here is the Alpha Centauri system, three stars in comparison with the sun. One slightly bigger and similar color, one slightly smaller and a bit redder, and one much cooler and redder. So for the next one here, what can we say about Alpha Centauri? The two stars, Alpha Centauri A and B, take about 80 years, and they go around in an eccentric orbit. There are times that they're closer than at other times. Speculation about planets, they vary between 11 and 36 astronomical units apart. Proxima Centauri, 13,000 light years away, astronomical units away. And it takes, they're not quite established, but they reckon it takes about half a million years to go around the Alpha Centauri <laughs> system. So more about this system on the next one. We can see here that each of the two stars may have a zone for planets here, may have a light zone. Proxima is really quite some distance away here. And if we move on another one, you can see here, yes, the distance between the two main stars, it can come in as far as, far as the orbit of Saturn, maybe going out past the orbit of Uranus, approaching Neptune. So that's Alpha Centauri. Now, what else can we say about Alpha Centauri? If we move on one. Yes, there were speculation about planets around Alpha Centauri. And, you know, the book's still open on it. But I think people want there to be planets there, but it's not fully happening there. If we can move on another one, then, what about Proxima? Well, actually, they reckon that there is a planet there, and a second planet, and possibly a third one that was discovered in between. Now, it's very nice to get some artists involved and get their artist's impression there, because Nobody can actually say that they're wrong, not at least until we've sent a space probe there, and that's not going to happen for a long time there, so we can have you know, good speculation about images such as this. Moving on one, there's another artist's impression. This one about a planet going around Alpha Centauri. And yes, we've got a kind of beach situation, slightly rocky beach, but yes, we can enjoy all this speculation there. It's all fairly harmless, but don't, don't be misled by anything like this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we can move on, another one here. Yes, here we have it again. You've got the two components of Alpha Centauri. One of them is about to under, well, maybe it's just risen, or maybe it's about to set. It all depends which hemisphere and all sorts of things like that. Maybe this is from the, a, a moon of a giant planet. Who knows? We can make up all sorts of speculation for this one. But maybe we're getting back to a bit more reality in the next one here. What would we see from, Alpha, from the components of Alpha Centauri? If we were observing from Proxima Centauri, look at this, magnitude minus 8.2, minus 6.9. Two stars that would be, well, maybe as bright as, um, certainly brighter than Venus, about as bright as a reasonable size crescent moon. Mm. Whereas if we were observing 
proxima pro alpha Centauri, magnitude 2.8, your standard naked eye visibility star. But observing one from one of the two components from the other, look at the magnitudes here, much brighter than the moon. Would they think of the other one as a sun? Would they think of it as a star? Who knows, really? I suppose um, uh, psychologists and linguists would get in on this, this one as well. So that's the kind of views that we have within this system. Then moving on, another one. I will, over this talk, present a few very bad pictures, as well as some very good ones. This is probably the very worst. And this is Alpha Centauri here. There's a nearby star in terms of position, but it's really much further away, Beta Centauri. And here we have the Southern Cross. We talk about Alpha and Beta Centauri as being, you know, they're the closest pair of first magnitude stars, or at least will be, before too much longer. And they'll form an optical double in a few hundred years, a few thousand years. But let's see if we can see a better picture of this area here. Yes, here we have Alpha and Beta Centauri. And in this circle here, this is Proxima Centauri. Now, it's not the brightest star in the circle, which is slightly off to the side. There is actually something red closer to the center of this circle. So just remember, this one here is marginally closer than this one here. This one here is considerably further away. So that gives us, you know, can we come back to this, uh, this remark, some stars really are brighter than others. Okay, if we move on from this picture, if we were to see the sun from Alpha Centauri, now it so happens that from a few of the nearest stars, the sun gets itself into interesting positions. From Alpha Centauri, it forms the next bit of the W of Cassiopeia. So obviously, we see Alpha Centauri in the far south. So looking the other way, it's a northern constellation such as Cassiopeia that it comes up against. So I think that's quite remarkable. It would be magnitude 0 0.4. One of the brightest stars as seen from the Alpha Centauri system, where are the multiple stars do give you some night, that has to be put in here. So, Alpha Centauri, let's move out just a little bit more. The next star that we come to is called Barnard Star. Just under six light years away. So we are seeing it in, um, as it would be around 2018. It too is not bright enough to be seen by the naked eye, it can be seen by a fairly standard digital SLR. It's also a red star. But the reason that Barnard, over 100 years ago, took interest in it, is it seemed to have the largest proper motion of any star. Watch this, note the positions of the stars, try again 10 years later, and they will have moved slightly. Barnard star moved more than any other star. So if we could move on, another one. Here is Barnard star in the constellation of Aphucus, Alpha, Russell Hay, Beta, Sebel Rai. But let's look at this rectangle here. You can see a couple of stars here. This star here, that is Barnard's star. So it's not particularly bright, but it is within the range of, of a, a digital SLR camera. What else do we have about Barnard's star on the next picture? 10 seconds of arc per year. That's how much it moves. 
it doesn't sound very much. It's a sixth of a sixtieth of a degree. It covers the moon's diameter every 180 years. So it's not fast, but stars have plenty of time to play with them. I mean, it has been said that an expert astronomer, when they were young, having a look at Barnard's star, and then having another look when they were older, you know, with the naked eye, if they knew exactly what the issue was and could remember back to the first observation, they could probably note that it had moved there. As well as going across the way, it is approaching the sun slightly. So about 10,000 years from now, it'll get to 3.74 light years from the Earth and will be magnitude 8.5. Still not naked eye. But the problem there, as we'll see on the next picture, is that Alpha Centauri has also moved closer over this time and is now 3.69 light years away. Barnard's star will never be the closest star to the sun. And we can see on the next one, I think we've got a picture of what's actually happening here. We see Barnard's star moving closer, Alpha Centauri moving closer, obviously in different parts of the sky, and they never quite cross. Barnard's star never becomes the closest. It starts to move away after about 12,000 years or so. Hopefully the next picture gives some details of its journey. Yes, it starts off in Ophiuchus, goes up, Hercules, up. It goes very close to the North Pole, and in 100,000 years, it will end up in the constellation of Orion, getting further and further away. So that's Barnard's star. If we look on the next one, now we can speculate, does Barnard's star have any planets? Now there's a long history of planets around Barnard's star, or at least a history of people thinking there are planets around Barnard's star. Peter van der Kamp spent a lot of his life looking at observations, suggested planets going around in eight years or 16 years, about the same size as Jupiter, but he could never convince other people about his observations. People were suggesting, well, actually, a lot of it is he happened to have regular refurbishments of his observatory every eight years or so, and that introduced some periodicity into the observations. And you know, it's now thought those planets that van der Kamp noted don't actually exist. <coughs> but what else? If we again we move on one, there was a surprising development around 2018. And that uh, made a different planet, much smaller, not much larger than the Earth, orbiting in less than a year. The artists got their act in on this. But if we look at the next picture, now thought not to exist. Now, isn't this a shame? Twice it's been thought to have planets, and twice reality has brought a harsh word into things. It's a bit of a shame. Well, that's. Barnard Star, before we leave Barnard Star, hopefully the next one will show, yes, the sun from Barnard Star. It's not quite the fourth star in Orion's belt, but fifth, sixth, whatever, around the same brightness as the three stars in Orion's belt. Admittedly, it's not the pure white of those stars, but more on the yellow. So that would be the sun as seen from, seen from Barnard's star. Moving out again, 
couple of brown dwarfs, and I don't want to spend much time talking about brown dwarfs, so probably this is the time that I will mention brown dwarfs. Let's move out a bit more. Wolf 359, just under eight light years away. Again, magnitude 13, no chance without uh, a substantial telescope there, but I reckon that there are a couple of other planets, a couple of planets around Wolf 359, so that's one to notice. It's in the constellation of Leo. Moving on, another one, Laland 21185, the other side of Leo, into Leo Minor. It's not too far off naked eye visibility. Binoculars, fine. Standard camera, fine. Again, a dwarf star, a red dwarf star. It is going to get a little bit closer. And if we could move on, another one. Yes, this one here is Lalanne 21185. You can see a few other stars for comparison here. This one here is about the limit of naked eye visibility. You can see this Lalan 21185 is a bit fainter here. Okay, if we could move on another one, it's exciting to note that yes, a couple of planets around this star. The first planet is called B, and the second one is called C. That's standard the way things work. The main star is called A. But you can see they are further out than the inner planets. Uh, and uh, of course, they are getting out as far, you know, one's inside the equivalent of Jupiter's orbit, one indeed is outside here. But we're getting planets. You know, this is this is good news. But well, assuming planets are good news, we have some such good news around. Low land 21185. Again, if we can move on one, a well-known star. And if it were not cloudy, I could have told you, we can go out at the end of the talk and it'll be rather obviously there. The brightest star in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the problem is the cirrus clouds. Um, Sirius is actually a double star, but look how much brighter one component is than the other. It turns out Sirius B is the nearest white dwarf to us, so it's an interesting comparison, the brightest star in the sky and the first and nearest white dwarf. We can see Sirius hopefully on the next one. Yes, here we have Sirius in the sky. This is another of the more bad photographs here. But I spent a lot of time annotating this one. And you can see Sirius is the bright star here. But all those other stars in the constellation of Canis Major, the large dog, they appear much fainter, but they really are much brighter because they are so much further away. So that's a view of Sirius here. Maybe this is one that I could do with uh, doing an update on. Better get my act together soon if it's to happen this winter. But a few other, other things about Sirius to say, if we can move on one. Yes, you've got Sirius B in an orbit around Sirius A. We can see, yes, it's about 50 whatever years that they take to go around each other. And it was the fact that Sirius itself appeared to move in position slightly that allowed people to see that there's actually a faint object in orbit around Sirius here. Now, this white dwarf is a very dense star. If we can look on the next picture, we see here a statement here that a spoonful of that star would weigh as much as an elephant. 
not particularly healthy looking elephant here, <laughs> but um, uh, it just still seems to weigh quite a lot here. So this white dwarf is actually very dense. Okay, moving on. The sun from Sirius. We are in the summer triangle here. It's almost as if we have the sun turning the view from Sirius of the summer triangle, well, forget about summer, into the summer trapezium or something, magnitude 1.9. So it would be fainter than the other three stars, but you know, it could still be the kind of asterism that they would be interested in there. Somehow the sun gets itself into interesting places as seen from some of the nearby stars. Okay, so moving out from Sirius, Luton 726-8, a red dwarf binary star here. Okay, and moving out again, we see it was a bit closer to the air 20, 30,000 years ago. So it's on its way out the Sun and Luton 726-8 are moving further apart here. Okay, if we move on to the next one then, a couple of more red dwarfs. Ross discovered quite a few red dwarfs here. I'm not saying they're close to each other, but in terms of how far apart they are, uh, how far they are from us, we can mention them in the same breath then. Moving on to the next one there, Yes, Ross 248, it will become the closest star to the sun in about the year 35,000. So it will get closer than Alpha Centauri. Look, by that time, Barnard's star is well on its retreat, so in the direction of Orion. Okay, moving on, another one we can see now. Well, Surely the Pleiades is not the next nearest star. But I mention this, and I start off with some good photographs of the Pleiades. If we look at the next one, we can see seven light years. You know, we're out at about, uh, well, the distance, the distance between two of the main stars here is seven light years. And if we've come out now to about ten light years, as we'll see on the next picture, you can see we've gone from an Pleiades scale from the heart to the edge of the cluster. If now we look at the next picture, we can see a, well, we can see a bad picture of the Pleiades, but you know, I quite like this one. But moving on to the next one. In the, star, the, the stars in the Pleiades cluster, are generally about two light years apart. Whereas in our area of space, we can see on the next picture that they're about eight light years apart. So the Pleiades cluster isn't that more, much denser than a typical area of, of galactic space where we are at the moment. So that's a bit of a diversion getting the Pleiades in. If we move on again, next star, Epsilon Eridani, ten and a half light years away, so we're seeing this one around uh, 2013 or so. Magnitude 3.7. It's not far from Orion, maybe below Taurus here. And what else do we have? K2, it is an orange star here. And it entered the Star Trek literature as possibly being the home world Vulcan, yeah, where the Vulcan race came from, although I have something more to say on that one. And if there's any questions at the end, I may be asking one of the questions. But here we have the star Epsilon Eridani. The next one may well be... Yes, 
the constellation of Eridanus. Here we see Rigel and Eridanus, the river, flowing this way, and then it flows back here and away down to the south here. But Epsilon is here. It's quite low here, but you can get decent pictures of this one. Comfortable naked eye star. It really is slightly fainter than the sun. But there are other reasons why Epsilon Eridani has in real science fact become interesting. If we can move on one, it's a young star discovered to be about 500 million years old. Magnetic field that spins. Thus, this discovered as long ago as 1988. And planets are thought to exist in orbit around Epsilon Eridani. So we can move on to the next one. That shows some details here. Planet orbiting every seven years, maybe another planet, asteroid belts, and so on. So there's a lot going on on this star, maybe a solar system in the process of being formed. OK, moving on. Yes. You can see inside a certain area in the disk here, it's depleted here, and they thought this might be the action of planets here. Okay, moving on again. The possible planets here, and somehow I think the artists have let themselves down a bit here. Uh, there's all sorts of things that they could have shown, but it just seems a bit of a, a confused mess here. But maybe it's my appreciation of art that's a blacking instead. We'll have to see. But anyway, moving on from this one. Comparisons between our solar system and the system there. Inner asteroid belt. just inside the orbit of one of the planets here, our asteroid belt, a little bit inside the orbit of Jupiter here. So possible comparisons here. Again, moving on one. What would Spock see as he looked back from Epsilon Eridani? He would see the Sun, magnitude 2.4, in the constellation of Serpent's Caput. So, we'll leave Epsilon and Eridani, and we'll move on here, past a couple of red dwarfs. You see Mr. Ross has got in on the act. Again, mention of planets here, and then moving on again. EZ Aquarii, a triple red dwarf system here. We're now 11 light years away from the solar system. More red dwarfs. Moving on again. The star 61 Cygna. This is a double star. Again, okay, orange dwarfs maybe, rather than red dwarfs. But this star is interesting in that it was the first star accurately to have its distance measured. So let's look a, a little bit at 61 Cygni, 11 light years away. Here we have the summer triad. Vega, Deneb, Altair, 61 Cygni is somewhere over here. It's not a particularly notable star here, but I believe that the next picture has a pointer on it. Yep, here it is. This is the star 61 Cygni. And in the 1830s, observations were carried out of this star to find its distance. So on the next picture, let's see more about this. Before Barnard's star was discovered, this was the star with the highest proper motion. Six arc seconds per year. Barnard's star reaches 10. This was what suggested to Frederick Bessel that it's worth trying to see, trying to measure the distance. This could be one of our closest stars. There were rivals measuring the distance to brighter stars, and 
Yes, I will put in a word for Henderson being the first to calculate, but Bessel was the first to publish his distance to the star. Now, if we move on one, let's imagine we have the star 61 sigma. And we see it against the starry background. Now, people could have tried going to different parts of the world and observing and trying to get a different angle to observe from, but that wasn't going to work. They couldn't find any appreciable difference there. But instead, what Bessel did was he observed in October, and also on the next one, we'll see he observed in April. So in April, he saw the star near the, well, the blue star and the red star, whereas on the next one, in October, we can see he saw it near the white and the orange stars there. He could measure the distance, the angle here, and I think the next four or five pictures just show the same thing with the star moving slightly upwards here, its own proper motion. But you can see if you observe, yeah, maybe we'll just go back one, if we observe at the various times, you can see it carry out the calculation. We are talking about a difference here in position of less than a second of R, less than a sixtieth of a sixtieth of a degree. You needed very sensitive equipment there, and what Bessel did may be thought of as um, abuse of astronomical equipment. He took a telescope, and he cut it in half from side to side and then had the two halves pointing slightly differently and was able to carry out measurements there. So, or at least they did that with the main, the main leg. So apologies if um, you feel a bit queasy hearing people doing this to perfectly good lenses, but he did it for a good reason. The end justifies the means and everything like that. But this was the first star to have its distance measured. The technique was established and could then you know, go ahead for others. So moving out then, you got a sneak preview of the next star being Procyon, the largest star in the constellation of Canis Minor. But uncanny resemblances with Sirius, a bright star and a white dwarf. You know, that's quite something there. And we can see on the next picture that we have, yes, two bad pictures here. But you've got Procyon here making an almost equilateral triangle with Betelgeuse and Sirius here. And then an even worse picture, although I'm like, it was taken just last week, it was cloudy, surprise, surprise, but somehow those three stars in what we call the Winter Triangle and most of the stars in the constellation of Orion, we're just missing the one here, just happened to find little gaps in the cloud at the same time. I thought this is too good to miss. Obviously, it's not taken with proper astronomical equipment, but you know, here we have the star for science. What else can we say about Procyon if we move on to the next one? The sun from Procyon would be close to Altair, just the opposite side of the celestial equator, magnitude 2.6. So the sun by this point isn't particularly bright. Whereas on the next one, we'll see the view of Sirius from Procyon in the constellation of Grus, magnitude minus 2.6. Okay, let's move out again. We've got, again, some red dwarf stars. More red dwarf stars here. And then trying once more. Epsilon Indy. 
we've got an orange dwarf star, a bit fainter than the sun, with some brown dwarfs or massive Jupiter, you know, greater than Jupiter size planets here. So that's quite an interesting one. Again, moving on, DX Cancri, another red dwarf star. And then again, moving on, Tau Ceti, a star which is quite like the sun. It's yellowish, well, orangey yellow rather than whitey yellow. Four to eight planets. You know, this is an interesting one here in the constellation of Cetus. Again, moving on. The artists have got in on this. And, you know, there seems to have been some impact. There's lots of comets and things. And then I put this comment here. It's the brightest star in the sky that is really fainter than the sun. There are stars brighter than this that we see in the sky, but they really are brighter because we will go to this at this standard distance. So the brightest star really fainter than the sun. Again, moving on, up to eight planets here, we can see, you know, some of them revolve around quite quickly. There's at least one that takes more than a year. They seem to be more massive than the Earth, but of course there's a selection effect. If they're larger, we are more likely to discover them. Again, if we move on, 11 red dwarf systems. So I won't mention them all one by one. You can see a few notes here. Some are double, some may have planets, some have interesting names or so. So we infer that the next one is not a red dwarf. The next, if we look at the next one, Van Manen star, a white dwarf, 14 light years away in the constellation of Piscis here. And yes, our friends coming towards the center here. If we move on another one, seven more red dwarf stars. One which is quite close to another star, so a lot of red dwarfs. I'll come back to this. Again, another Luton star, 15.1 light years away, another white dwarf star here. And I realize it's in danger around here of turning into a bit of a list, but we'll put a stop to that soon. Yes, a couple of, um, yes, and one more, well, Ross and Lees are fighting over the name here. 15.2 light years, red dwarf star with at least four planets here. Again, moving on, we can see the system here. Two days this planet takes to go around the star. You know, talk about days and years and everything. I'm assuming it's going to have captured rotation, but we really don't have any way of knowing that at the moment. I uh, mean, the, you know, the artists have done quite well here. Again, moving on, more red dwarfs here. And possibly another dwarf, brown dwarf. Okay, this one's K rather than M. And again, if we... Ah, 40, Eridan. It's not a red dwarf. It's an orange, yellowish-orange star. With a red dwarf and a white dwarf. A triple system here. The white dwarf reckoned to have planets. And I read in the literature that this was also said to be the home planet where, you know, where Vulcan actually was. So maybe if somebody knows how this paradox that two different ones are mentioned here, if someone wants to um, uh, uh, give more information, I'll be, I'll be willing to, to listen there. I've got my speculation, but I'll keep quiet on it for the moment. So, this is 40 Eridani, and then moving on, 40 Eridani, we're back to the same picture, it's also known as Omicron 2, it's a little bit closer up towards Orion here. Okay, if we move on again, we have come to five parsecs. 
16.3 light years. So I'll stop mentioning every star individually and start to summarize things. So let's have a look at a few well-known stars. Altair, 16.6 light years. <clears throat> Maybe moving off the main sequence. So we can see where Altair is on the next picture here. Yes, summer triangle. This is Altair near the bottom here. We'll see this picture a couple of times more. But for the moment, if we look at the next one, the sun from Altair, magnitude 3.4, it's not far from Sirius and Procyon. Okay, moving out a little bit further, Gliese 445. It is magnitude 11, moving almost directly towards the end. And let's see a few more details of this. In 48,000 years, it'll only be 3.2 light years from us. It'll be our nearest star. There's one more along those lines to come. But for the moment, yes, we see this blue star comes in. Alpha Centauri will probably come to three and a bit light years. It starts to recede. Gliese comes a little bit closer uh, for a mere 10,000 years or so. Okay, moving on out. Vega, 26 light years away. A brighter star, but still a main sequence star. And Vega is also in the summer triangle picture that we'll see on the next one. Yes, Vega here. Okay, go a little bit further. The sun from Vega. Magnitude 4.4. It's not going to be at all obvious by now. But between Sirius and Canopus. Okay, another Glee star. Again, radial velocity towards the Earth. It's 62 light years away. And then if we look in a bit more detail, we can see that this one, we're talking more than a million years in the future, this will come about one light year from us. So this is going to be the nearest star in the very distant future. And then only for a little while, then it'll start going further away again. Okay, moving out a bit more. Regulus is 77 light years away. And we should see a picture of the constellation of Leo now. Yes, here we have Regulus, the sickle of Leo here. And again, continuing our journey, Canopus, 310 light years away. Now, in the 70s, Canopus was thought to be far, further away than we think now. It was magnitude, it, they thought about it being magnitude minus 7. But it seems more accurate observations have yielded that it's a little bit closer and therefore a little bit fainter. Moving on, we can see the sun from Canopus not even visible to the naked eye. Now, ignore the constellations here. There would be gross distortion because we are so far away. So this is what we'd see from Canopus, but moving further out, Denner, the furthest away of the bright stars. Estimates range from 1400 to 2600 light years, but your absolute magnitude minus seven, minus eight. A real super giant here. And we can probably see Den of about here in the summer triangle. Yeah, that wasn't a bad guess, the way it would come. I've shown this one a few times. But yes, here we have Den of, but it really is so much further away than the other stars here. The sun from Den of, what would it look like? Magnitude 30. Forget about it. And of course, probably not even mentioning, worth mentioning, it would be in Vila, not far from Canopus, but you know, the concept of the constellation would be so grossly distorted there. But we can go further. 
the star chi to Orionis is about 4,000 light years away. Similar <laughs> absolute magnitude to, to Deneb here. And the sun would be magnitude 16.5. So we see this star at magnitude 4.7, the furthest away of the naked eye stars. It's over towards Gemini rather than Orion. And maybe if we move forward to, yes, this is a slightly better picture. Look at the street there that I've not seen before. But we have Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, there's a little conglomerate of stars here. You've got the stars in uh, Gamma, Geminorum, but Chi to Orionis, this is the furthest away of the naked eye stars here. And moving on, we see here, yes, let's do a bit of a census about what we've seen. Now, hopefully, you've been keeping notes and we'll be able to confirm all of those figures. But we have 70 stars plus the sun, five white dwarfs, one A, one F, three G class stars, eight orange dwarfs, and 49 red dwarfs. So red dwarfs seem to be by far the most populous. Well, let's bear that in mind. But then if we move on, Three stars are brighter than the sun, 67 really are fainter. So that's something worth considering here. Now maybe just a couple more things to say. What's the nearest star, which the nearest giant star? Mm -hmm. Any thoughts here? We won't count for Cyan, which may be just leaving the main sequence. Uh, but, but, yeah. well, okay, see. let's see. Arcturus is a giant star. It's just 36 light years away. Betelgeuse is a little bit further than that. It's up into the hundreds. It's, so it's a, more of a super giant, Betelgeuse is. Okay, moving on then. Yes, here we have Arcturus here. We've got Corona here and uh, your Pouates up and down here. Okay, if we see the next one. We've been working our way out to Altair. We reach 60 stars, and if we can just move out two or three here, out to Regulus, 10,000 stars. The next stage out to Deneb, 50 million stars. And I think we've got one more in this sequence. Out to Kai 2 Orionis, 300 million stars here. Now, the next one is what I think it is, yes. We're seeing, we've reached the stage, we're getting into galactic scales here. Chi to Orionis is a bit along the spiral arm from the sun. And you can see if we look the same distance in other directions, we're going between or across the spiral arms here. <coughs> okay, let's uh, see something else. Once when I asked, when I gave this talk, I was like, well, what's the nearest Messier of? Let's see, the nearest is the Pleiades. A good picture, a not so good picture of the Pleiades, but you were talking about 400 light years away. So comparable with say, Canopus and so on. So they're not in our backyard, but they are the nearest messy object. The next nearest one is the double star that we will all wonder why did this one end up on the Messier catalogue. Surely, Messier wasn't in danger of thinking that this was a comet, but we'll probably never know the answer to that one. I think we jump forward to about number six, the Dumbbell Nebula, just over a thousand light years away, and within the top 10, we can see the Orion. I just saw it. We got a very brief glimpse of a good and a bad picture of the, yes, yes, this is what happens when you try and make any astronomical observations. Now, what do you reckon? Is it worth trying to retrieve it or will I just sum up now? Uh, it's down to you. Let's just 
try a little bit to, uh, to retrieve it there. But I'm going to be asking now, why are Swinton and Mexborough like the sun? So, yeah. So we'll get a very brief <laughs> recap of the talk here. So now you'll be able to see if all those numbers were actually correct. Oh, yeah. So, out to the fly, these. He spoke a little bit quicker, we threw a shot. Dr. Poseidon. There's going to be a lot of editing of tonight's talk. <laughs> <Well, then. laughs> so we're, getting, we're getting closer <laughs> there. And then, yes, here we have Orion. You know, the Orion Nebula M42, about 1,600 light years away. So, you know, it's about the, could be the same distance as Den of there, but obviously in a different direction. So maybe the next one is asking this question. No, we've we'll jumped there. Okay, let me ask the question anyway. Why are Swinton and Mexborough like the sun? They're both going to blow up eventually. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Most important place it's also. Well, that's 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 true. Yes, yes. But I was simply going to say that well, there are nearby places at around the same this around the same size. Places like I believe, and at this point, I'm in danger of incurring the wrath of everybody by introducing local rivalries, but. Um, uh, Places such as uh, Conisbra or Rothlandine are about the same, the same size there. In the same way that uh, such places as such stars as Alpha Centauri and Tau Ceti are around the same size as the Sun. Why are Swinton and Mexborough like the Sun? There are smaller places nearby here. There are smaller places, there are smaller stars near the sun. We've seen Epsilon Eridani or various other stars here that are a bit smaller. And around our two towns here, you can see there are many small villages. We're near Putin. There are many small stars. All of those red dwarfs, which are much smaller than the sun. But go the other way. Near the sun, there are such stars as Sirius, or Alpha Centauri, or Procyon. Stars that are bigger than the sun. There are towns nearby, Rotherham, Doncaster, Sheffield, that are much bigger than the sun. And then you've got the cities throughout the world are so much bigger than Swinton and Mexborough. And on the other hand, the stars such as Deno or Chi Tu Orionis, again, are so much bigger than the sun. So there's a comparison there. But to draw things together here, I started off with those quotes. You'll remember Ian Nicholson said, the sun is a very ordinary star. Although Patrick Moore said it would be a mistake to say that the sun was particularly feeble, it is about average. So we had to talk about um, the meaning of the word ordinary and average, but I said that the sun was, la was larger and more powerful than all but three of those 70 stars in our sun. So my counter to those quotes is the sun is larger and more powerful than about 90% of stars. Thank you. Oh, we don't want to see that view. I beg your pardon, that's my wife you're talking about. Right? <laughs> Actually, we do want to see that view. It shows, it shows Colin. Just give us away, Colin, so you could... Oh, yes, yes, then. Yeah. So we'll leave it uh, like that. So, uh, have we got a question in the room? 
Uh, Tony Morris. Hi, Colin. Hello. Uh, we had a talk many years ago at the Society, and I, I don't know whether it was Manchester Astronomical Society or one of the local societies in Manchester. They were actually photographing Van Asta to see if they within the life of their society they could actually see it move in the photo. That's a that's a worthy a worthy thing to do, yes. Yes. I mean you're talking you know 180 years the just the, the the width of the moon. So I don't know what's a reasonable time scale for this kind of experiment. 40 years or something that's uh I think it might have been Salford astronomers oh, yes. for doing it. I think they were trying to do it. Well, yes, yes. And, uh, next time, I, if I do go there again, I can. Uh, the, the Salford Society, of course, have something in common there. They also meet in Switzerland. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Roy, Roy Dunson. Yeah, uh, on your door, on your diagram, the one about how the stars approach the sun and then move away. I think it was Gleasy 410, which is one and a half million years time. It's going to come. One light year away or thereabouts. Uh, that suggests to me that the frequency of stars approaching that close is fairly regular. And it raises questions about how stable the Earth ought to have. Well, that's true, yes. I mean, uh, one light year, one light year, of course, is still something like a thousand Pluto distance. <clears throat> but even so, it's. Um, uh, you know, it, 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 it does suggest yes, there would probably be a few a few comets set off by that. Mm. Most of them, of course, um, you know, if a if a comet comes in and you know if it comes in from um, a thousand astronomical units to fifty, we could well just not see it at all. But you know, if it comes down to less than five, then yes. Good news for comets viewers. Um, at the back of our mind, yes, could this set off um, various what we call call dangerous events here? Yes, it it could. I'd like to think by that time. Uh, well, I feel confident by that time one or one of two things will have happened. One is that we've learned to deal with this kind of thing, and I think you can tell what the other one might yeah. be. <laughs> I mean, the other thing is that. Easy for ten will have its own or cloud, which well, that's that, that, that's true. I mean, there's a there's a bit of, of symmetry there. Uh, when, of course, if I were to talk about you know similarity between galaxies colliding, the likelihood of actual stars colliding is very small. They pass through each other and all get distorted. I mean, there could be something similar. I mean, the difference is, of course, you've got a dominating object. Within each of those systems, uh, but um, yes, it's it's one for speculation. That if, if rather than one light year, it was zero point zero one light years, who knows? You mentioned you oh, mentioned oh. Pleiades, um, and uh, Pleiades is a uh, an old uh, stellar nursery within the star group that you've been talking about this evening. Are there any candidates of stars that could have been in the same stellar nursery as our sun? Ah, now, my understanding is that since the sun was formed, it's probably been around the galaxy a couple of dozen times. Uh, uh, that we've seen that things like Barnard Star moving quite quickly. Okay, maybe Barnard Star isn't the best. One there, but you get some stars, they come in quickly and then they leave quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Something like Alpha Centauri is um, is moving uh, with respect to a you know, reasonable speed with respect to us over the thousands of years. It spends a reasonable time close to us, but generally what happens is none of them stays here for any particular length of time. So when I mean, the other stars from this, uh, this same cluster could well be you know, hundreds or, of light years or whatever further away. Uh, maybe the, the, pro the problem is trying to, trying to extrapolate possible candidates back 
yep. several orbits of the galaxy, at most several, uh, possibly taking into account a few irregular things happening on the way. It's a difficult one to answer. <coughs> but I know that there, there, there have been people working on this kind of question. Okay. Yeah. Right. Oh, brilliant talk, by the way. Thank you. Well, um, you mentioned that nearly all our closest stars are either M plus or K2. Is there a reason for that, or is it it's just because they're the most common star? Yes, I mean, there's in terms of uh, what's happening here is probably not too atypical of what's happening in the outer parts of the galaxy. If we had a similar sample from near the galactic core, we'd get told, we'd get different results here, but well out into into the arms, uh, with every reason to believe this is this is typical there. But it does seem along the lines of. Um, uh, when, often when things form, you get a few big things and various smaller things, a lot of them. I mean, I've heard it said that if you were to make a list of all species of animals and other life forms, you could probably list all the life forms that were generally bigger than a human being, you know, elephants came up, things like that, you could probably fit them on a single page. Uh, and then in terms of those that life forms that were smaller than humans, you would have many, many different books on them, you even to list them. So I think there is a there is a tendency that um, big things are big things are rarer than smaller things. And of course this distribution could well keep on increasing into the into the planets you know, within within the solar system uh okay it's been a self-forming system uh but you've got one big thing the star three or four things about a thousandth of that size another half dozen ones a thousandth of that size and then getting on to many many more around asteroid size and so on so I think it's part of a distribution of there are more small, more things are small than are big. But yeah. well, you can also work it out this way. You can do the, uh, I'm not volunteering, but it'd be possible to do the maths of uh, how things form. People, I'm sure, are doing that. So. Cheers. Any other questions? No, Tony, I'm just, just carrying on from that question. So. Do you think our galaxy is typical of other galaxies? I would say to a, to a first approximation, um, uh, it might be that if you look at elliptical galaxies that um, you get a, a slightly different story from spiral or barred spirals like, like we're in, but uh, I think it's probably a lot to do with, you know, if you go into the innards of a galaxy, you'll get, um, uh, you might well get something different there. You probably get more of the larger objects there. Um, uh, I would say, yes, comparing with um, the majority of galaxies, you'd probably find something similar. I'd argue ours is better. Most. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, the reason I waited for the end, I'm quite interested in your uh, theory about Vulcan and, and that sort of thing. I know that Gene Goddenberry sort of wrote into a magazine, I think, in fact, in 1991 ish, 94, something like that, uh, when I think it was originally 40 and the planets were, were sort of discovered, and said, yes, if you were stood on one of those planets, uh, you know, it would lie, it, it, it would look. Uh, very similar to how I just, you know, described Vulcan. Uh, so there's a lot of speculation around that. But sort of, what's your theory? Well, the re the reason why two of them seem to get a mention, I do wonder, and I I am aware that yes, I will I will enjoy watching the episodes. Uh, probably the more original the series goes, the more I will watch them. But. Uh, you know, I am aware that there are people who know so much more 
about this kind of thing. Uh, but I do wonder if, yes, Epsilon Eridani, that was established for a while, but then when they found out it was such a young system that they, they maybe thought, well, it has not had time to, to form planets that give rise to life. If you think about how long the Earth lay lifeless in the early eons of its existence, and it was a very slow process at the beginning, and then gradually gained momentum there. Maybe they thought that uh, Epsilon Eridani just hadn't had the time for that to happen, so we need to move things elsewhere. But um, I may well be very, very wrong about that. And they moved it to uh, something that looked as similar in many ways, similar kind of name, that uh, possibly didn't suffer from the complications that came up. Of course, the story of the original planet Vulcan, the one that was speculated to lie between the between Mercury and the Sun, that is a very interesting story as well. Yes, we recently had a talk around mm. around that as, as well at the beginning of the year, I believe. Mm. Uh, so another bit of Star Trek uh, sort of uh, trivia for you. So uh, Wolf uh, 359. Oh, I don't. I don't believe you didn't talk about the Borg attack. Oh, the oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, yes. I mean, it's it's obviously good to see you when when the science fiction tries to base it on actual facts and that. Very, so, very positive. One of the yeah, yeah. So, could I just ask a very general question? Hmm. You know, the Hirschsprung Russell diagram yes. goes down to M, which has now been extended. Has that got any relevance to what you've been talking about, about new stars? And well, you can talk about your stars that were just so cool, so uh, little mass that they didn't quite reach the, the point where the thermonuclear reactions could, could take place. Uh, but yes, they would be to the right there. Yeah. I mean, I remember reading about, um, yes, uh, G, K, M, and then there was R, N, and S. But my understanding is that those were parallel, parallel to K and M, but just a little bit different. Yeah. Okay. But yes, at some point it becomes fundamentally different, different when you're considering things that are not clearly stars. I say not clearly stars as opposed to clearly not stars. But are any of those nearer? I what? did mention a couple of red dwarfs, uh, not much, not much further away than Barman yeah. stars. So you know they they are around. It just I thought if I started mentioning them, uh, then there would be even more yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, there. What I'd like to think you know, the talk there uh, considered very various different stars and different things that were happening, but there is a point in that pocket that is starting to look a bit like a list. <laughs> yeah, sorry, going on to the, the sort of from the RNS, uh, the, the usual monomic okay. gets up, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me, and then it's right, right now smacked. Smack. <laughs> yes. Yes, I've, I've heard various... Uh, yeah, yes. yes. <laughs> okay, um, Having a quick look around, can't see any more questions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, will you join me in giving all a huge Mexican suit to Aston Society? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.